you're probably wondering what all that was, and I'm here to tell you, we'll get to that. I'll be taking you to a place that needs a lot of introduction. We're traveling to Egypt to visit the legendary Karnak complex. But before I take you there, I'd like to explain a little bit about this amazing cultural and historical site. This impressive complex in Luxor consists of obelisks, pylons, decayed temples, and chapels. Karnak is a massive area of where different pharaohs added and tore down previous pharaohs' work. The immense size of the complex, as well as its various architectural, artistic, and linguistic details makes it a highly valued historical site and resource for understanding the evolution of ancient Egypt. The temple complex is one of the more well-known Egyptian temples. Commonly known as Karnak, the name was derived from the Arabic word, which means fortified village. Now that we have a general understanding of what and where Karnak is, let's get into the history. Construction began during the reign of Sunasret I in the Middle Kingdom era and continued in the Ptolemaic Kingdom. The debate on the actual origin of the temples of Karnak started in the late 18th century with the expedition to Egypt commissioned by Napoleon in 1798 to 1801. Every pharaoh that reigned during the different dynasties was responsible for adding their own parts to the complex. The more pharaohs reigned, the more specific architecture and technological techniques were able to advance. Now that we've gone over a little bit of the history, let's talk about one of my favorite subjects, architecture. Because Karnak is such a large complex full of different religious and cultural buildings, it was divided into different sections, including North Karnak, East Karnak, South Karnak, West Karnak, and the Karnak Center, Amun-Ra's Temple. Specifically, the Festival Temple of Tutmos III is arranged with a large array of pylons, clerestories, a hypostyle hall, obelisks, an avenue of sphinxes, and a sacred lake. Materials used throughout the different structures were pretty consistent and included sandstone, a sedimentary stone, limestone, another sedimentary stone, and red granite, an igneous rock. These were the primary types of stones used throughout the structure, so they were seen more often. Whereas other stones like red quartzite, another sedimentary rock, black granite, an igneous rock, and travertine, another sedimentary rock, were utilized in much smaller quantities. Traventine was also called Egyptian alabaster. Now that we have context, a time period, and we've talked about architectural achievements and materials, let's move on to the more cultural side of things. Hieroglyphics adorn many temple walls, columns, and the inner sanctum. They tell different stories ranging from Egyptian mythology to the stories of the pharaohs that started the construction of Karnak. The art slash murals on the wall included the classic Egyptian canon, which depicts the important parts of a person, usually in a procession to the main part of the mural. This look is seen everywhere at Karnak and any other remaining temples and was a staple within the Egyptian community for thousands and thousands of years. These paintings, or more like carvings, were chiseled onto the walls and were called reliefs. In tombs and in temples, reliefs were carved into the wall and later painted over with decorative paint. These reliefs are considered to be more abstract and a way for the ancient Egyptians to display their ideas of perfection and hierarchy. Wait, this just sin. Luxor citizens are being denied access beyond the pylons of the gates. But why? Well, this was the principal religious center of the god Amun-Ra in Thebes during the New Kingdom. Certain areas were restricted to the public and even the pharaoh. Being the largest building for religious purposes at the time, the complex was known as the most select of places by ancient Egyptians. Priests had to even go through a cleansing ritual so they could be allowed access to the god's home. The complex remains one of the largest religious complexes in the world. When Ramses was pharaoh, he would cover up pharaoh's additions to the complex and replace them with his own reliefs, essentially covering up their names and erasing them from history. Speaking of, let's get into the mythology or religious lore that surrounds Karnak. The pharaohs of the time had specific gods they wanted to honor with the cult temples. After all, temples were said to be the places where gods resided and looked after their followers. There are a lot of different stories and long histories of lore associated with the gods at Karnak. So let's get into who lived at this complex. The temple of Amun-Ra is considered to be where that god lived on earth with his, with his wife Mut and son Khonshu. No, not that one. That one. But who the heck are these guys? And what do we know about them? Ra, or later Amun-Ra, was the king of all deities and the father of all creation. He was the patron of the sun, heaven, kingship, power, and light. 
He was not only the deity who governed the actions of the sun, he could also be the physical sun itself as well as the day. Mut is the Egyptian mother goddess. She married the sun god Amun and mothered all creation. Some consider Mut to be the queen of heaven. Her main temple was located close to the temple of Amun. Khonshu is the ancient Egyptian god of the moon. His name means traveler, and this may relate to the perceived nightly travel of the moon across the sky. He was the son of Mut and Ra, which is why he is usually depicted as a youth. At Thebes, he formed part of a family triad, the Theban triad, with his mother and father. Whew, well, that was a lot. Now that I've explained the history, culture, architecture, and art, I think you're ready to see it for yourself. seen it, thank you very much for taking this journey with me. This complex and the temples inside are known as some of the oldest and most religious places in Egypt. Many new architectural structures were thought of and first constructed here, like the pylon and obelisk. It holds great cultural significance to this day and is one of the world's oldest examples of religious buildings. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to see it yourself and embrace its history. Turf war.